All right. Good morning. Pastor Mark called me Thursday morning and told me he wasn't feeling good, asked me if I could fill in for him. And I said yes. And then I hung up the phone. I started coughing immediately. So somehow he got me sick through the phone. Insult to injury. He called me Friday night. He's like, I'm feeling a lot better. And I'm dying. Um, so the real reason I'm sick is because I have three little kids at home. I have a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and a six-month-old. And... Uh, they're pretty disgusting. <laughs> They're little incubators, man, little petri dishes of germs, and, and um, they really are filthy. Like, uh, we give them baths and dress them up to bring them to church, but the rest of the time, they're nasty. They've, I've seen them do the grossest things. I mean, they just no respect for hygiene or personal space or any of those kinds of things. And uh, my daughter, Claire, you know, uh, I didn't get married until I was a little bit older, and whenever I'd see kids with runny noses, I'd just think, man, you have bad parents. You know, this is, this is bad parenting. And, um, and God has humbled me, man, since I had my daughter. Since she, she's two, since she was born, her nose has not stopped running. I could, I could quit my job and dedicate the rest of my life just to wiping her nose, and it still wouldn't be clean. And she's this beautiful, cute little girl. And... Um, I love her so much, and, and I want her to know, grow up knowing that, man, her dad loves her, thinks she's beautiful, thinks she's smart, thinks she's fun, and, and so I love taking her out, and I just, some guy is going to come later on in life, and she's going to be totally unimpressed by him, you know, because she had a dad who loved her and took good care of her. But, um, yeah, thanks. Wait, you're going to think I'm a bad dad here in a second, but um, uh, She's regularly like, like, Dad, give me a kiss. And she's got snot like running into her mouth, you know. And I'm just like, oh, I know what the right thing to do here is, you know, take one for the team, kiss your daughter. But she gets less kisses than the other kids because <laughs> this is why, because I'm sick right now. So you're all going to have to suffer along with me. Uh, this is uh, the, the kids, if you're unfamiliar with, with church uh, kind of the church calendar. You might not know what these kids are waving palm branches for as they came in here. Um, or to the, behind me, we have the cross with the palm branch behind it. And that's because today we're celebrating Palm Sunday. Uh, palm Sunday is the inauguration of, of um, the last week of Jesus' life, the inauguration of Holy Week or Passion Week um, that we celebrate in the church. And it's probably the most holy week all year long for us as Christians. Now, we as a church, we don't do a lot of formal high church kind of stuff, right? We don't, um, uh, in a lot, if you grew up going to a more mainline denominational church, then you had, you know, the pastor who wore the robe and the special robe and there's special signs and all kinds of services and all that kind of stuff. And we as a church, we've never done very much of that. We've always been sort of a more um, informal church. Uh, Mark and Dave grew up in a Lutheran church. It was very much like that. I grew up in a Presbyterian church. It was very much like that stained glass, pews, hymnals, that kind of stuff. And, and, uh, but I never knew anything about having a relationship with Jesus growing up. I, I went to church my whole, I knew, um, like, like this week, we're going to have Palm Sunday. And then on Thursday, we're going to celebrate what we call Maundy Thursday, which is the day we celebrate the Lord's Supper. And, um, and then Friday is Good Friday. It's the day that Jesus is crucified. Saturday is Holy Saturday. He's in the tomb on Saturday. And then Sunday, we celebrate Resurrection Sunday. Easter, we celebrate the resurrection. And um, I grew up knowing, the na- knowing, knowing what Maundy Thursday was, but not knowing about having a relationship with Jesus. And so I think we're really sensitive here to the fact that you can do religious things and, not, and they can be meaningless. You can not know Jesus. Um, and and I remember the first time I came to this church, I was freaked out. I, I've told you this story before, but um, this is... This is the very nice version of Foothills. This is nicer than we've ever had before. We used to meet in that building over there. We actually started in a little corner over here, but I, I came to church when we were meeting in, a, in the building over there. It was just a warehouse in an industrial district, and it looked nothing like a church at all. And I walked in, and there was like people in t-shirts, and people who looked homeless, and, and uh, people raising their hands. I, these are all completely unfamiliar to me, and um, and I just remember thinking, this is for sure a cult. Like, there's a, there's a cult in an industrial district in a place in East County. Do not go there. And, um, and so, so we just have never been the kind of church that has been about formalities. 
And yet there's something really beautiful, something really good about setting aside seasons or times in your life to focus on God. And, and so much of that symbolism is so rich and so powerful and so meaningful that, um, that I think we can really benefit. And so I would just encourage you in this next week for you to just kind of consecrate yourself. You set yourself apart to meditate on the cross and the resurrection and who Jesus is and, and what that means for you and what it means for the whole world. And in kind of going with that theme, I want to talk about Palm Sunday this morning. I want to talk about Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And so if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and open them to Luke chapter 19. The story of the triumphal entry is told in all four gospel accounts. There's actually not that many stories that are told in all four gospel accounts. The triumphal entry is one of them. And we have more information about this last week of Jesus' life than we have about any other um, portion of his life. And, and so the Bible just has, uh, is, is rich with meaning. And, um, and, and just we get a lot of the story about Jesus' life. Luke 19, starting in verse 28 It says, after he said these things, he was going on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he approached Bethpage and Bethany near the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village ahead of you. And there as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one yet has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and they threw their coats on the colt and put Jesus on it. And as he was going, they were spreading their coats on the road. And as soon as he was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God with, joyful, with a joyful and with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen, shouting, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Or as it says in Matthew 21, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the son of David. Verse 39, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus answered, I tell you, if, if these became silent, the stones would cry out. I told you you're going to have to bear with me. Um, you know, to understand this story of what's going on here, I think it's important for us to get a lot of context. This is Jesus' triumphal entry in the last week of his life. He's, he's coming on the road to Jericho into the city of Jerusalem. It says that he comes over the Mount of Olives from the east. Now, every year, this story is reenacted in Israel. And um, I just want to show you a quick video of that reenactment um, so it gives us a kind of a, a little bit of a picture of what is the context, what's the geography that we're looking at as we, as we listen to the story. So go ahead and play that that short video. This is the view of Jerusalem coming over the Mount of Olives. You can see the Dome of the Rock there on the left, that big gold um, domed place. It's a, it's a Muslim shrine. It sits on the Temple Mount, which is exactly where the, the, the Jewish temple would have been at that time. This is the people in the reenacting the procession. Go ahead and pause it right there. Okay, so, this, so just so you understand the geography, and, and this is what's so great. If you ever have a chance to go to Israel, I encourage you to go because it makes so much of what you read just come to life, and you can understand it so much better. This is from the Mount of Olives going down into the Kidron Valley and up into the city of Jerusalem. That wall right in front is the Temple Mount, um, right in front of the Dome of the Rock, is the Temple Mount, and that's where the temple would have been. So this was very much like the same picture Jesus was seeing as he came over the Mount of Olives and is descending into the valley and then up into the city of Jerusalem. This would have been a very short walk, okay? This is not very far at all. It's not even as far as it looks like on this screen. And um, one interesting thing I want you to note is, is look to the left right there. What are those things to the left of those people? Those are grave sites. Those are tombs. And, and actually, this entire valley is filled with tombs, which is interesting. We'll come back to that in just a minute. So, um, this is the view that this is very much the view that Jesus would have had as he came into Jerusalem. Now, what we have to understand about this day that Jesus is coming to Jerusalem is the context of this story is, is radical. Jesus is doing a very profound thing, a very radical thing as he goes into the city of Jerusalem. 
which Jesus' ministry, most of what Jesus did occurred in, not in Jerusalem, but in Galilee, in the, in the area of the north of Israel. That's where primarily his ministry was. It's where his, his hometown was, and also the base of his ministry, which is a city called Capernaum, which is right on the Sea of Galilee. And yet, Jerusalem is where the temple is. It's where the, uh, the religious um, seat of power is. It's where the, the, um, the, the Jewish king would, would, uh, would sit in Israel and, and the Roman occupiers would be in Israel. And Jesus regularly had problems with the religious elite. And so regularly um, he was in conflict with those people and they were in Jerusalem and he was in the city. But now Jesus is coming into Jerusalem and at this point in Jesus' ministry, um, Jesus is at the apex of his popularity. Um, if you know, early on in Jesus' ministry, he was regularly trying to like stay away from the crowds and not get people to follow him. But that's out the window now. People are just, he can't, he can't hide from the throngs of people that are following him. And this story occurs um, just a couple days before this, he, rose, he raised Lazarus from the dead. And Lazarus was a prominent uh, man in, in Bethany, so word had gone out of, the, dude, this guy's raising people from the dead. This guy is a miracle worker. He's amazing. He goes into Jericho. If you remember, in Jericho, it's where he heals blind Bartimaeus and another blind guy. And then as he's coming through the city, um, it says that Zacchaeus, the tax collector, wanted to try to get a look at him, but he couldn't even see him because of the throngs of people that were all around him. And so Zacchaeus had to go climb a tree to get a, to get a picture of Jesus. This is all happening right before Jesus is going to be coming into Jerusalem. And him coming to Jerusalem is going to be a big problem because the religious people there, they hate him. And so they're, they, they, he has threatened their power and they're actively plotting to destroy him. And so, so as everybody knows, as Jesus comes into Jerusalem, this is going to be a problem. In fact, it says in, in Mark chapter 10, in Mark's account, it says, They were on the road again going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking on ahead of them, and they were amazed, and those who followed were fearful. In fact, the, the, the apostle Thomas said, let us, go with Jerusalem, let us go to Jerusalem with him and die then. They recognize that as he comes into Jerusalem, there is going to be some serious conflict. There is going to be some trouble. Now, there's, there's, there's five other things that if we're going to understand the story, we need to understand the context here. And, and the first one is this. This is happening the, at the beginning of the week that they're celebrating Passover. Now, if you remember what Passover celebrates, Passover celebrates the time that God miraculously delivered his people from slavery in Egypt. Right? You remember that they, they killed the lamb and they, they put the cross above their door beams and the angel of death passed over their houses and went on to kill the firstborn of all the Egyptians. And that is the way that finally Pharaoh let his people go and God miraculously delivered his people out of slavery. So not only is it a religious holiday, but it's also a national holiday. It's the, God, the time that God established the people of Israel, the Jewish people. And it's kind of like our 4th of July. It's kind of like their Independence Day, right? So... As they're, as they're coming into the city, the, in, in the city at the time, that pilgrims would come from all over the place and descend on, on Jerusalem um, to, to have their, their Passover meal and make their Passover offerings. And it's estimated that between 2 million and 2.5 and million people are in the city, which in ancient times is a crazy amount of people. The other thing you have to understand here is that the Roman occupation grated against the Israelites. They had been under Roman occupation for about 96 years at this point, and they hated it. They believed that, that God was going to, when, when God took them out of exile in Babylon and reestablished them, that God was going to bring them back into their glory days, that they were going to be an independent nation, and that God was going to bless them like they were under David and under Solomon. Well, God had brought them out of, out of um, exile, but they hadn't returned to their glory. In fact, they're living under pagan occupation by these Gentiles who were, who were godless people. And they had to pay taxes to Caesar and they had to, they had to worship Caesar. And so as Jesus is coming into Jerusalem in the Passover, they're thinking to themselves, this is the time. Maybe God's going to do it again. God miraculously delivered us from the Egyptians. Maybe now is the time that God is going to miraculously de deliver us from the Romans. And so this, this fomenting of rebellion was was everywhere, and people were talking about it, and people thought that's what Jesus was doing. So the first thing we need to understand is that this is Passover. The second thing is the donkey in this story. Um, the donkey is a weird part of the story. He tells his two disciples, go into the city, get this donkey. If, the, if anybody asks you about what you're doing, just say, the Lord needs it. They go in the city, they find a donkey, they start untying the donkey. The owner's like, uh, excuse me, that's my donkey. And, and they said, the Lord needs it. And next thing we know is they just 
came back with the donkey. You know, we don't know if the guy was like, oh, okay, or they had to punch him in the face, or what happened that they got the donkey back. We find out in Mark that this is a specific kind of donkey. This donkey has never been ridden by anyone before. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried to ride an animal that's never been ridden before, but they don't like that. They're not used to it. And so, so but, but this donkey had never been ridden before because this donkey had been set apart for this exact purpose. What, what you have to understand is this is not just a random detail that they're adding in, but this is a prophetic fulfillment that God had prophesied about all the way back in the book of Zechariah. That the king, that the Messiah would come into the city on a donkey. And what you have to understand, too, is that the people, this is an incredibly biblically literate society. They would have understood this. They would have understood the meaning of what it meant that Jesus, and you never find Jesus riding a donkey another time, but he picks specifically this opportunity. He walks everybody, he picks this opportunity to ride into the city on a donkey. Here's the prophecy in Zechariah 9, 9 and 10. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem, and the bow of war will be cut off, and he will speak peace to the nations, and his dominion will be from sea to sea and from the rivers to the ends of the earth. And so as Jesus is riding into the, the city of Jerusalem on this donkey, people are recognizing this really is the Messiah. Go ahead and put up that picture if you have it up again. Remember those, those tombs and those, those graves that were on the left-hand side right there? There's another prophecy in Zechariah 44 that says that the, the Messiah is going to come from the east. And this is the east. What, what is right behind that tree on the right is the eastern gate that goes into the temple. It's called the beautiful gate. One of the interesting things, if you go to Israel today, you'll find that this entire Kidron Valley is filled with tombs. It's a Jewish, almost the entire thing is a, um, what do they call it? Yeah, thank you. A Jewish cemetery. What the Jews believe is that when the Messiah comes, he's going to raise the dead. And these are people, the, those tombs, it costs about $50,000 to be buried in that valley. Because those are the people that believe that when the Messiah comes, He's going to enter in through the east. He's going to enter through the eastern gate and that um, those people were raised from the dead. On the, the eastern gate is actually what you go. If you look at it, it's walled up. Solomon the Magnificent in, in I think, the, the ninth or 10th century, he, he, he bricked up that gate because he, he, didn't, he knew about this, this Jewish prophecy that, that, Solomon, that, um, that, that the Messiah was going to come from the east. And so he bricked it up. And they put a Muslim graveyard right in front of that thing because they believe that no holy man would ever walk over a Muslim graveyard. It's actually terribly sad. It's sad that all these people have missed it. All these Jews have missed it. The Messiah has already come. He already did come from the east. He already, he already did enter. The, the Muslims have missed it. Jesus, the Messiah, doesn't care about walking over dead bodies. He came for dead men. He came to make dead men alive. So there's, there's no... No Muslim graveyard is going to stop the Messiah from, from coming. And he did come, and this is what we're celebrating today. The third thing is the palm fronds. It might seem like a weird thing to wave palm fronds, but palm fronds had special national significance in Israel. They were like flags, basically. On the door of the temple were etched palm fronds. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 and 10, it says, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, and palm branches were in their hands. And they cry out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So as these people are waving palm branches... They're, they're praising God and they're crying out. The fourth thing is this. They're crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. The word Hosanna is, is uh, for the Greek word Hosanna. The Greek word Hosanna is for the Hebrew word Hosanna. Okay, so uh, when you open your Bible and you read it, um, if you read the New Testament, the reason you're not reading Greek is because the, inter- the Old Testament Hebrew is because the interpreters have gone through and they've, they've taken the closest English word for the, either the Hebrew word or the Greek word. But this word Hosanna, there's not really an English equivalent to it, and so they've just left the word Hosanna. Hosanna, is, it comes from Psalm 118. It's this, it's this, this worship 
song, this hymn that they were singing as he came in. And what it means, it means something like salvation or freedom or bring us salvation or bring us freedom. And so as they're coming in, they're laying down these, they're waving these palm fronds and laying them down, taking off their coats, which represent who they are. And they do this for the king as the king crossed over and saying like, we are under your authority. We are your subjects. And they're, they're waving these palm fronds like we would flags on as the president goes by or something. And the final thing is all of this is happening in the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a special city. There's actually no other city that's like it. It holds a special place in the Bible. Jerusalem is the place where God chose to build his temple. You remember before this, um, they had the tabernacle. It was, the, um, it, was, it was basically the presence of the Lord lived in this tent, and the, and the Jews would take it wherever they went. But, but when God had Solomon build the temple, he said, this is the place where I'm establishing my permanent home. This is the place where I want all people to come and worship me here. God had chosen the city of Jerusalem. And all of these facts are coming together to make a really clear picture that the king is coming to his city. And the people were out there and they were worshiping because they had been praying for a king. They had wanted a king. They had been hoping for a king. They wanted a leader who would vanquish their enemy Rome, who would restore the kingdom of Israel to its former glory. They had pictured in their mind who the Messiah was going to be and what the Messiah would do. They were looking for a king who would do what they wanted. That is not the king who they would get. But Jesus was really clear. He is a king. He's the king of kings. Look what it says. In, in, in fact, this same week, he's going to go and he's going to stand before Pontius Pilate. It says, as a lamb led, be, he would be silent as a lamb led before his shears for his destruction. And he's only going to say one thing. And it's going to be an answer to this question that Pilate's going to ask him. John 18, 37. Therefore, Pilate said to him, so you are a king? And Jesus answered and said, you say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. And everyone who is the truth hears my voice. And Jesus is most definitely the king. And Jesus is coming to Jerusalem to take his crown and to take his throne to receive his authority. But it's not going to be to drive out Rome. It's not going to be to drive out the corrupt priesthood. He's coming to Jerusalem to die. Look what it says in Ephesians 1, 20 through 22. This is which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead. This is what we celebrate on Easter. When he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age which is to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet. Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And yet it's not what the people expected. Jesus is coming to make peace. He's coming to give the terms of his peace to his people. Look what it, let's go back to, to Luke 19 and let's finish this. Verse 41 through 44 says, as, as Jesus is coming up the road to Jericho, he's going to come over the Mount of Olives. It says, when he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it, saying, if you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace. But now they have been hidden from your eyes, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side. And they will level you to the ground and your children within you, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Go ahead and put that picture back up there. The Mount of Olives sits a little bit higher than in Jerusalem. And so as Jesus kind of crests the hill, he looks down at the city of Jerusalem and he just begins to weep. And he's weeping not because of the cross or because of what's in front of him. He's weeping because he's a king who's coming to make his terms of peace with these people. And yet he knows they're going to reject it. He knows that they've already made their heart, they've already made their minds up. It says in the book of Mark that, that Jesus, when he looks at the city, he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how many times I've longed to gather you together as a mother hen gathers her chicks, but you would not have it. 
You killed the prophets and you killed the messengers whom I sent to you. And so as Jesus comes over, he sees what's going to happen to the city of Jerusalem in the future. And, and that's what happens 40 years after his death, 40 years after he says this, Jerusalem is going to be laid waste by the Roman Empire. It's going to be utterly destroyed. And it's going to be just a vacant lot for hundreds and hundreds of years. And, and the, the siege of Jerusalem is going to go down in history as one of the bloodiest, most horrifying battles that's ever happened. And it's going to happen because the people did not receive the terms of peace that their king was offering. He says something very interesting at the end of that. He says, he says this is going to happen because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. That's an interesting phrase. What does it mean, the time of your visitation? What was the time of their visitation? If you go back to Luke chapter 1, 68 and 69, it says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us. This time of visitation was the opportunity that people had to turn their hearts to God. Opportunity for their redemption and for their salvation. And yet Jesus knew that they wouldn't accept it. You know what's interesting about a time of visitation is that it's temporary. It doesn't last forever. When your in-laws visit you, it means they're not going to stay forever. I should say, I think my in-laws are in here right now. They are really good people. And um, me and my wife are so grateful for them. Please keep babysitting. But when they... When they visit, it's temporary. It's almost like an open door. And he's saying, he's saying that the city of Jerusalem, his people, they have an open door. But the door is not going to stay open forever. It's interesting that you can be so close and yet so far. It's an interesting verse in the book of Hosea. It's actually Hosea 7, verse 8. Hosea is prophesying against the tribe of Ephraim, and he says, Ephraim, you are as, as a cake unturned. It's an interesting picture that he says, a cake unturned. Think about pouring out um, uh, like pancake batter on a griddle, and you just leave it there. What's going to happen to it? It's going to burn on one side, but it's going to be totally raw on the top, Right? And he's saying, he's saying, Ephraim, you are so close, and yet you remain untouched. You were so close to the day of your visitation, and yet you didn't even recognize it. You missed it. The city of Jerusalem had the King of kings and the Lord of lords in their midst. And there are many, many people who are totally going to miss it. As Jesus came over, the Mount of Olives, and he looked down on Jerusalem. There's about four kinds of people in there that are going to respond, four different people in there that are, four different responses to him, four different responses to his lordship. They're very similar to people's responses to Jesus today. The first one was this, it's just open rebellion. As the king was coming into his city, there were people who were plotting his murder. There were the Pharisees who were getting together, who were thinking, how can we kill him? They hated Jesus. They were in open rebellion against the king. Because he threatened their power. He threatened their ability to be kings of their own little kingdoms. And they knew it, and they hated him for it. So the first group of people are people that were in open rebellion. The second group of people is probably more than that, though. These are people who were just kind of disinterested. They didn't see what difference Jesus made to them. They had their lives set up and all the normal things, and they didn't see why Jesus really mattered in their lives. It was just another story to them. And so they just went about their business. And yet it was the time of their visitation. They didn't recognize it. 
The third group of people is, is a lot of these people who are out on that road that day, putting their coats down and waving palm fronds and, and shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. These are people who misunderstood Jesus. They thought that this is finally the day. The king is going to come in. He's going to come into the city and he's going to overthrow the Romans. He's going to overthrow the corrupt temple and, and he's going to restore the national uh, uh, glory of Israel. You know what Jesus did when he came into the temple? So the book of Mark, he came down the, the Mount of Olives, came up the Kidron Valley, came into the temple, looked around, and went home. He, went, he was staying in Bethany. He went back to Bethany. He didn't do anything. You know, there's so many people that as long as God is doing what they want him to do, oh, praise Jesus, Hosanna, Hosanna, glory be to God in the highest. As soon as, as, soon as he's doing something they don't want him to do, Crucify him. None of these people, very few of these people are going to be there later on the same week when he's crucified. People want a God that they can control. People want a God that's going to do what they want him to do. Jesus is not that God. He's not that king. If you want to be your own king, okay. You've made your decision, but Jesus is not the king who's going to do what you want him to do. The Bible says, who will be his counselor? Who has something that he needs? No one. No one. You have nothing to add to him. He is altogether perfect and sufficient. He's the king of kings. The people are going to rebel against him. There's people who are disinterested. There's people who misunderstood him. And finally, there's people who believed in him. As the king was coming into the city to make his terms of peace, there's people who received them. There's people who followed him. Here's the terms of his peace. If you receive his lordship, if you put your trust in him, if you surrender your life to him, then he will, then he will accept you. He will cleanse you of your sin. He will make you into a son or a daughter, and he will share all of his kingdom with you. If you reject his terms of peace, then there is no substitutionary atonement for you. You are dead in your sins, and there only remains judgment. You know, what's interesting is as God looks out across the world today, he sees something very similar to what he saw when he came over the Mount of Olives. He, see, he sees people that he loves. He sees people that he came for, people that he wants to make terms of peace with, people to whom he has come and visited, that he has given an open door. And he's beckoning us to come through that open door, and if we do, he will receive us as his sons and daughters, and if we don't, all that remains in front of us is judgment. And, and in this room this morning, it is full of people who have, who have recognized the time of their visitation, who have received him as king, and, and he is your Lord, and, and you have experienced his favor, his blessing. And he's given us something else to do. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 through 12. He says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. We are the subjects of his kingdom. So that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. For once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. And once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and as strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, don't miss this, that they may because of your good deeds as they observe them glorify God in the day of their visitation. God is still visiting people today. And he has called us 
to be ambassadors to his kingdom, to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel that all men might be saved. These are the terms of his peace. If you accept them, he will receive you as a son. If you reject them, you will, you will suffer judgment. He makes it even more clear. 2 Corinthians 5, 19 through, 19 through 21. Namely, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting the trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Because at the cross, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So today's Palm Sunday, we're celebrating his triumphal entry and leading up to Easter. And Easter is a really interesting holiday in America. You know, most holidays uh, are poorly attended in church. Not Easter. Anybody will go to church on Easter. Your dirtbag cousin will go to church on Easter. (laughs) Your neighbor who is not given one thought about God the rest of the time, he'll go to church on Easter. You got to be a real reprobate to not go to church on Easter. It's amazing how many people you can get to go to church on Easter that the rest of the time would never come. We have, have been working really hard on our Easter service this year. And we've been praying that this would just be an opportunity that God would very clearly lay out his terms of peace. He would very clearly lay out what the good news is. And that people would have an opportunity to receive him. That they would recognize the time of their visitation. Do me a favor. Go ahead and take out this insert in your bulletin. This insert is something we put in there that we want to join you with praying for the people that you're praying for to share the gospel with in the next coming weeks, week. And so on the top part, there's a little, there's five lines there, and and that's intended, we just came up with five, it's arbitrary. You could put one, you could put ten, it doesn't matter. But um, these are just people that, that you feel like the Lord is, is calling you to share the gospel with, is calling you to invite to Easter and and that, that God might be giving an open door to them. And in a minute, we're just going to pray and ask God, God, would you burden us? Would you give us a, um, a burden for the people that you're really after, those people that you're visiting right now this week? And, and would you give us an open door to speak to them? And would they receive um, what we have to say or receive our invitation? And then the bottom part of that is, is, is we want you to copy those same names, the people you're praying for, and that we as a staff, we as the pastors on staff, want to join you in praying for those people. And, and, and if you could... Put your name at the top of that too. It helps us to, um, we're going to have you tear that off and the, they're going to come around and collect them with the, the ushers are going to come around and collect them. But you tear that off and just put it in the bulletin or, or put it in the, um, in the offering basket as it comes by. We want to pray this week for, for you as you, as, you sh- as you go and ask those people, invite those people to Easter. We want to pray that God would open up a door for them. So let me just pray and ask God that God would speak to us and, and just reveal, give us some revelation about who in our lives, what friends, what family members, what co-workers, what neighbors that God might be trying to get a hold of. Lord, God, your word says that, that you don't wish that any should perish, Lord, but that all would come to repentance, Jesus. So, Father, would you just speak to us right now as a church, as individuals, God, would you speak to us, Lord, Lord, who would you have us reach out to in our life, God? Who are you speaking to right now, God? Who are you calling to yourself? Lord, who right now this week are you visiting, God? Lord, would you give us an open door to speak truth into those people's lives, God? Would you you give us an open door to invite them to come with us to Easter service? I'm going to invite the ushers forward. So they're going to start passing around the, the, the offering basket. If you just put that in there, um, we we'll, would like to join with you and pray this week. And um, we're going to, um, this is going to be a little bit weird because we're just going to turn the lights down. We're going to continue to worship the Lord. Um, the service isn't over. Um, so let's worship God. <laughs>